Hey guys, all right, so in this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna show you how you can use your Tesla and you can actually access your Windows PC at home or a Linux device um, right off of your Tesla. So let's go ahead and get, let me show you how to do this. So we're gonna first go ahead and go to the web. So I apologize here if my camera is gonna be a little bit shaky. Um, it's, I'm trying my best to do this with one hand here. So I was like going to a bettertheater.com and the reason why I wanna go there first is I wanna be able to use the full screen mode. So once this car goes into full screen mode, give it a second here. Now once it does that, I can actually use the on-screen browser uh, to go ahead and do this. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna go ahead and browse. So we're gonna go to, go to site here. I'm gonna use the um, browser built in there. And now I'm gonna go to, now remember this domain that I'm about to go to is my own domain. Um, after this video, I am gonna take it down, but I'm gonna show you how to set this up. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go to mytesla.tk. And the reason why I use mytesla.tk is this is the domain name. Uh, that is going to point basically to my Cloudflare server. Cloudflare is then going to connect into my home router, which is going to connect into the Guacamole server, which is the one that's going to be hosting the connections to my Windows and Linux machine. And I'll explain all of this later on in the video. But let's go there. And so what's happening here is it's actually taken me to this is my computer at home. So this is actually running on my server right now. And so if I type in Guac Admin. And again, I will show you how to do all of this step by step. Um, and more importantly, I will um, put the code in my video as well. And so the default username and password for guacamole is guacadmin, guacadmin for both. Now it's gonna ask me for an authenticator uh, code here. So I'm gonna go ahead and log into my two-factor authentication, um, put in the code. I'll be right back in a second because I have to do it on this phone. So give me one second. Okay, so I put in the code, it's good for 30 seconds, hopefully end in timeout. As soon as you hit OK, so now this is actually running on my server at home. So again, um, this is going through Cloudflare, then which is going to uh, my home router and then eventually into my server at home. Now if I hit Windows 10 on this device here, it's going to say connecting. And now you actually see my Windows PC boot up. Um, the experience is so far it's okay. With Windows it's not too, too bad. Um, so I can do something like, uh, for example, click on Microsoft Edge. What you'll find though is it is a bit laggy in terms of experience. Now if double click doesn't work because I for the life of me can't figure out how to get a keyboard to work, you can just hold it down and hit open. And so now there you go. I can actually browse websites on this. For example, if I go to Yahoo. Okay, so there we go. I go to yahoo.ca, it takes me to Yahoo, which is cool. Um, I can do browsing. I mean, you can do browsing on your Tesla anyways, regardless. So, I mean, that's not the most impressive part here at all. But if you wanted, you can always go ahead and open up something like VS Code if you are so inclined to go ahead and program in your Tesla. Now, I will say, obviously, this experience would be a, a lot better if I can hook up a keyboard or a mouse. Hopefully, Tesla does support that in the future. I may go ahead and try out a couple of different keyboards and mouses just to see if it actually works. Um, if not, you know, again, you can open folder. You can do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, start coding, do whatever you want, which is kind of cool right off, like I said, right off of your Tesla. So let's go ahead and close this out. And let's go back, and now I'm going to show you the Linux machine that I've got on here. So if I go back, now I can go to Linux Raspbian, and then go ahead and open this using a VNC connection. Let's go ahead and cancel the Windows one. Now Linux does take a little bit longer. I do find it is a little bit more laggy, but you know, it works. And the way I would say the use case for me would be if I want to, if there's certain scripts that I want to run, for example, if there are certain files, I'll just have them on the desktop. I can double click, I can run them, I can do whatever I want. Um, so I don't have to, you know, mess around too much with going and finding the files because the file systems are also tough to navigate uh, without a keyboard. So again, I can do something like open the Raspberry Pi menu. Uh, that opens up here. I can go ahead and obviously go in the browser. I can run the command file or the command line tools here, terminal. And part of this is also probably due to my connection. Uh, it's running a little bit slow, but anyways, this is my Raspberry Pi and I can do, I have on this, you know, on, on my Linux devices, I have a whole bunch of stuff that I run all the time. So, I mean, if I just keep that on the actual Linux desktop, um, I can use it. But again, you can see it's a bit buggy. It's not perfect. Uh, but again, like I said, if you put things on your desktop and you need to run them, 
just by a double click. Um, that'd be that'd be kind of cool. So for example, I have scripts that tell me how much I've saved today um, compared to if I had an ICE car, for example, uh, based on my daily rates, based on how much I've charged, um, based on my trip distance. I have all those scripts that are built in and I sort of run those off of my phone. I may actually put them on here. So if I ever want to use them, I can just double click um, and it'll tell me all that information. Um, or if you want, you can put your home automation stuff on here as well. You know, turn off your lights, turn on your lights. Um, all of that could be ran off of this, especially if it's just a single script and you double click. Um, I see a massive, massive benefit for that. Um, I can actually, if I go back to Windows, um, I can actually um, also access my uh, my home, home assistant. As you can see, sitting on my Windows, I actually have my home assistant here, right? So, but of course, you know, whenever you're typing, you need this keyboard. The only annoying thing I find is that it's hard. You can't really hide the keyboard, so you have to go back. Um, and you have to go back into your settings and turn it off. So what I've done instead is I've just gone ahead and added it as a uh, favorite so I can go ahead and access it because for the most part, Home Assistant is a touch interface um, anyways. And again, I wouldn't say this is something you're going to use on the regular, probably something that um, you know, you're going to use every now and then. And again, so one of those annoying situations here where... I have it in my favorites, but now it's going to ask me to authenticate. So I got to bring up the keyboard again, which is kind of annoying. Um, but anyways, there are, you know, and if you put it on your on your uh, desktop as a uh, as an icon that's already been authenticated, for example, then you can go ahead and use it. Um, I'm what I'm going to use this for really is to just have scripts sitting here. So if I want to run something, I just double click. It's easy for me to do and I can use it. And so that's really so, sort of some of the cool stuff that I, I guess I'm going to do with it. And remember, I'm not a Windows user at all. So there's probably stuff in here that I'm doing that is completely wrong because I'm uh, through and through a Mac user at the end of the day, um, but also a Linux user. So I use Linux and Mac almost equally. Um, but when it comes to Windows, not very much of a Windows user nor a big Windows fan. Um, but I have it there because it's easy to connect to Windows and if I ever need something, I can do that. But again, I'm going to be testing with this playing around. If you guys want to do it as well, please do it. Leave your leave your comments in the description. Let me know how you guys are using this as well so that if there's something creative I can add to this, I'm happy to do that um, as well in another video. So let's get into the back end now. Okay, so let's see how this is actually going to work. So here you're going to have your Tesla car. Now, what's going to happen with your Tesla car is it's going to use the browser, the onboard browser like I showed you. So it's going to be a browser base. And what it's going to do then is that it'll connect into your home. And then once it connects into your home, for some reason I can't draw a proper H, but that's supposed to be home. Um, it's going to then actually go ahead and when it connects to your home, it's going to be connecting through your router. And once it connects through your router, then it's going to go ahead and connect to the server which in our case is sitting on a Raspberry Pi. So this is a Pi server. And the Pi server is basically what holds um, the actual guacamole server. And then it'll actually then remote into either using something like VNC or RDP. So if it's RDP, it's going to be Windows. And if it's VNC, it's going to be Linux. And in this scenario, where really the sort of the, the point of differentiation around safety comes is really sort of around your connection between the browser and the router. And so there's actually two ways to do this. The first way is to directly connect your browser. And you're going to go ahead and go to your public IP, right? So your public IP is basically what your ISP is giving you. So I'm making this up. But it's not necessarily a real public IP or it could be, but I don't know whose it is. But something like this, for example, your ISP or your internet service provider will give you a public IP. You connect into it, it'll open on port 80, and then it'll go ahead and connect into your server. And what you're going to have to do is you're gonna to have to port forward from your home to your server. So anything that comes on port 80 basically needs to go into this server um, and point to port 80 on this server because we're gonna be setting up, setting up a reverse proxy using Nginx on this. Now that's one way to do it. This is definitely not the recommended way. And the reason why it's not the recommended way is it's a safety hazard. First of all, this connection is over HTTP, which means that it's unencrypted. And you don't want that. So that, that's the first challenge. Um, and the second is you don't want to expose your public IP because you can have, um, you know, not 
the not the so good guys uh, log into your to your router and do some. Um, they could do some damage if you have some open ports or if you're not sure what you've done, especially using tools like Kali Linux, for example, and and going in and doing some uh, pen testing type um, work. So they can really basically pen testing is penetration testing. They can penetrate into your server, and you definitely don't want that, or into your home, and you don't want that. So there's a different way to do it, which is the more preferred way to do it. Um, and that preferred way is actually using an SSL certificate. So let's go over that. Now, before I do, actually, I did forget to mention one thing here. When you do log in from your router into your server, you're actually we're actually going to add in two-factor authentication as well. And so what that means is every single time uh, you log in, you're going to be using your username and password. And then every 60 seconds, you'll basically get a new token. So you use a tool like Authy or Google uh, Authenticator or something like that. Um, but we'll walk through how to set that up very shortly. Uh, but essentially, this is this is sort of the construct of way things are going to look like, the architecture where things are, are would look like if you were to basically do a non-encrypted connection. And this is definitely not what I recommend. So let's go over the second solution now. Okay, so the other way to do this is we're going to go ahead back and we're going to draw our Tesla. Pretend this is our car because I can't draw for the life of me. Then you're going to, again, use your HTML5 browser. Now this time what Tesla is going to do is when you actually use a domain name, so I forgot to mention that in the first instance, you could technically use a domain name on just port uh, 80 and using an HTTP, but we're not going to do that. Um, but in this case, uh, we are going to go ahead and get a domain name. So I'll show you how to do that in a second. And we can get a free domain name for now, uh, but you have to pay for it after a year or so. And sometimes it's tricky to get, so you're going to have to compromise on the actual naming convention of what you want. But we'll set one up. Um, I have a permanent one. I'm obviously not going to show that one in this video that goes directly into my into my home router using SSL. I'll set up something fake, um, put it up, and then once the video is uh, up and running, I'll take that down. So anyways, here we go. So we're going to use a domain name. So we'll pick a domain name uh, later on. That domain name will have SSL. Okay, so we are going to fully encrypt it using a, we'll use something called Let's Encrypt, which I'll walk through in a second as well. Um, and now what it's going to do is it's going to use a, a tool called Cloudflare. What Cloudflare does basically, it's a type of a proxy so that if I were to go to this domain name, let's say it's, you know, mytesla.com, um, if somebody wanted to resolve that domain name back to an IP address, if I don't use something like Cloudflare and don't proxy it, it'll actually expose your public IP. And again, that's a little bit dangerous, so you don't want to do that. In this case, what happens is Cloudflare will basically take in your public IP so it takes in your public IP and it shoots out a proxy IP. And so what happens is if somebody tries to go back and resolve mytesla.com, it'll give this proxy IP and it'll hide your public IP. And that's exactly what you want to do. Um, and it'll also, Cloudflare is actually awesome. It's free. Um, there are paid tiers, but it's awesome. There's also cool features in there, such as um, ensuring that even if you go to an HTTP site, it'll automatically forward it to an HTTPS. So there's no way to actually use an unencrypted connection, which is cool. Um, then this will actually go into your home router. And again, for some reason, my pencil won't let me draw a proper H, but that's an H that stands for home router. Um, and then home router then will actually connect into, again, using 2FA. It'll connect into the Pi, and then the Pi will connect or render it back using HTTPS, and that's exactly what we want. That's a security that we're looking for, and we want to make sure that we're protecting our home and stuff, um, as well as our server, and all the integrity behind it as well. So we're going to do a couple of things now. We're going to go ahead and set up the domain. Then I'm going to show you how to put it into Cloudflare. We'll quickly set up the actual uh, guacamole server. Now, there are better tutorials than probably what I can do on how to set up guacamole. My instance is a little bit more advanced because I've used something called Kubernetes. Um, but you can put this in Docker, you can install um, plain guacamole just on the actual PC that you want to use, um, or, or whatever you want to do it. I'll show you very quickly how to do this in Kubernetes for those that are interested. I'll leave my Kubernetes script also on GitHub so that if you want to copy it, you can just use it as is. There's no um, information in there that is um, unsafe for me to share, so I don't have any usernames or passwords or in there or anything like that. Um, but we'll walk through all of this, so let me show you how, the, how to set this up. So in order for us to go ahead and get that free, do free domain, we're going to go to Freenom. Uh, Freenom is basically a service that allows you to go ahead and get a domain for a certain amount of time. I think the max you can get it for is a year. 
Um, the only thing is it's a very finicky website. Um, and that's, you know, expected given the fact that it's free. But if I pick something, for example, like my Tesla and check availability, it shows that my Tesla.tk is available. Now, if I just hit get now, it's going to show not available because uh, again, that's how it works. So the way to get this work is you actually type in my Tesla.tk because you know that that one's available and basically hit selected. You go to checkout. It's going to go ahead and ask you for an email address um, to validate yourself, obviously. So let's go ahead and see what it does here. So I go to Freenom. Um, I got my Tesla.tk, which is what we're going to use. I'm going to go ahead and the max you can go is for 12 months. So let's go ahead and do that. Hit continue. Now, the other thing here, just um, it took me a while to figure this out because I was getting a little frustrated. But once you put in your email address, which I'm going to block off here anyways, but let's go ahead and pick one of my email addresses. So we'll use this one. Uh, do not hit enter. If you hit enter, what ends up happening is it says that you're not a real human because I think it's looking for a click. So make sure you click verify my email. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and log into my iPad and verify this very quickly. Okay, so here here's the actual email, the validation email. Um, so everything's hidden here. So I don't have to worry here. So I'm going to go ahead and click this link. And hopefully I have a domain, mytesla.tk, which would be kind of cool for a year. Now again, I'm going to use this. If it does work, I'm going to use this um, for now. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, delete it after because I don't want to keep it. Uh, so let me go ahead and fill this information out to complete this order. And then we'll come back. All right, I'm back. So here we go. It's uh, confirmed. The order is confirmed. I was able to get my Tesla.tk. Let's go to Cloudflare. One of the best tools, I swear, on the planet. It's awesome. So we're going to go ahead and log in. I'm going to go ahead and log in here. I'll hide all this stuff. Okay, we're going to go ahead and go to add a site here. So I got my Tesla dot tk so we're going to go ahead and hit add site we're just going to use the free one hit continue okay so we're scanning your site dns records to import automatically into your cloudflare so we're going to go ahead and add a record so uh, records with no icloud dns so uh, my tesla dot tk so i'll just use this as root i'm going to go ahead and use my public IP address. If you don't know what your public IP is, you can just go to whatismyip.com. Hit save. Continue. So now we have to point Cloudflare's um, servers. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and remove these, which is what it's asking me to do, and we're going to add in Cloudflare. Okay, so again, we're going to go ahead and change these name servers. So I'm going to hit copy. We're going to go back into the client area here. Go to services. Go to my domains. We're going to go manage domains management tools and we're going to go to name servers so we're going to go to use custom name servers enter below so we'll use this one and then the other one we need to use is this one and we'll hit change name servers okay so that should be done so if i go back here and now i hit check name servers so now it says great news cloudflare is now protecting your site perfect exactly what i wanted so if i go here um, right now, everything is off um, encryption, all that other great stuff. So let's go ahead and check the DNS. It is proxied. You see my personal server is blanked out here for obvious reasons. Um, let's go back. So, okay, cool. So basically what's happening now is that anytime somebody goes to mytesla.tk, instead of going directly into my server, it's actually going into Cloudflare. Um, and Cloudflare is going to go ahead and return something. So just to test this out, let me show you something here. So let me bring in uh, this. We're going to type in host and we're going to type in mytesla.tk. And what this should do, so these are actually Cloudflare's um, DNS servers. So I know I can, I recognize these. These are definitely going through Cloudflare. It is not mine. Um, if you type in something like, for example, hostgoogle.com or .ca, you know, this is basically what uh, Google's um, IP resolves back into. If I didn't go through Cloudflare, if somebody just typed this in, host.mytesla.tk, it would show your IP address, and that's what you don't want to do. So that's why you want to make sure you go through Cloudflare. Okay, so let's close this up. And let's go ahead now and set up our Kubernetes instance. All right, so this is my Kubernetes file, and I'll leave a version of this 
um, on my GitHub page. But essentially, here's what we're doing. We're creating a new namespace. I've called the new namespace guac, right, for guacamole. Um, what we're going to be doing then is creating a deployment file. And in that deployment file, again, we have the name of the deployment. We have the namespace that it's in. Right now, I'm just set it to replica one. Um, so I don't need to have multiple versions or copies of it. If something goes wrong with it, it's going to go ahead and recreate it. Um, I use a tool called uh, Com Compose, basically, which converts a um, Docker Compose file into um, multiple files, which are sort of put together into this. Um, and then the Docker version for Raspberry Pi creates something called, or has something called extensions. And extensions basically allow you to use different types of authentication protocols. So we're going to go ahead and use auth dot dot uh, one time token, basically. Um, this is the Raspberry Pi version. It's, it hasn't been maintained in over a year, but it still works pretty good. Um, it points to uh, port 8080 in the container itself. Okay, then we set up a config file, um, which will always restart if something goes wrong. Uh, we're using a persistent volume claim, and that's what it's called. For the persistent volume claim, I'm using something called Longhorn, um, and you can look up Longhorn. It's basically a distributed storage method. I've got about five Raspberry Pis that are running in my house, and they're and they're um, clustered together in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so you have distributed storage across all of them, which are accessed through this. So it pools the storage together. If something has, one node goes down, the other ones sort of take over. So there's uh, replica copies of it as well. So in terms of uh, where this is pointing, so this uh, could go away. Actually, we don't need this here. Um, but essentially what we have is we have uh, an HTTP connection. I'll call this local actually, just so that people don't get confused between HTTP and HTTPS. So all this means is on my load balancer, when I go to port 8080, it's gonna go ahead and forward that to um, 8080 within the container itself. And then finally, when I go down here, this is my ingress file. Um, and all this is basically saying, so I'm gonna go ahead and change this to two because I already have an existing one. Um, all this is uh, basically saying is that within this namespace, create this ingress file and with that ingress file, I want to use the Nginx um, reverse proxy. I want to go ahead and use a Let's Encrypt certificate. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use SSL so that if even if I even on my local host, if I try to go on this and I try to use HTTP, it'll force me to do HTTPS. Although when you go to Cloudflare, that option actually exists here, where you can go under SSL, and over here you can actually say I want it to be fully encrypted. Um, I generally use full. I don't use full strict. I find sometimes it, it messes things up for me, but it's okay. Either way, you can use you can use full strict, I guess, as well, because we are using a uh, trusted CA certificate. Um, so that's fine. So you can use full strict there. As a matter of fact, I should change my other one to that as well, which I will after this. Okay, so let's go back to here. Um, so I'm using the Acme. That's true. So this is basically my ingress so that anytime somebody goes here, it's going to go and hit my service in the background, my service file for this Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then I have two of them. I don't know why. So let's get rid of this one here. Just make this a little bit cleaner. Um, this is basically saying that I want to use a TLS connection. I want to get my certificate and I want to store it under my secret, which is going to be called my cert.tls. So let's go ahead and run this file. So let me go first find this file here. I probably should have put this under an entirely new namespace on its own. Um, let me go ahead and do that actually. Just I don't want to mess anything up in my original namespace. So I'll call it guac2. Um, so anything that is called guac for namespace, we'll just call it guac2. Um, basically, it'll separate um, this into an entirely new namespace. So when I want to get rid of it, I can just delete the namespace, go into Longhorn, delete the storage associated with that namespace, and then sort of move on. Okay, so let's go ahead and rerun this. Now, well, let's just for the sake of it, run it. It's going to create a brand new namespace. Um, so our namespace is created, deployment is created, service created, this is created. Um, so I can just go ahead and delete this. So sometimes the persistent storage deletion is a bit of a pain with Longhorn. Um, but anyways, there's ways to do it, so we'll, we'll do that later on. But anyways, everything should be created now. So let's go ahead and look at if, there, if the pod's running. So kubectl, let's make this a little bit bigger. Get pods, and then in the namespace, we called it guac2. So the container's still creating, so we'll give it a second, and uh, let's see what it does. In the meantime, I need to go ahead and uh, open port 80. I generally keep port 80 closed on my, um, on my router. 
uh, just obviously for safety reasons. So anyways, it's running now. So let me go ahead and see if it's actually running the certificates. Let's see, so get, okay, so it hasn't ran it yet. Let's see what's going on. Oh yeah, because my port's closed. So let me go ahead and open up port 80. I think this will fix the issue, so let's do that. I'm gonna do that on a separate screen here. Okay, so let's go back now. My port 80 is open. And what we're gonna do is I'll just go ahead and delete this certificate um, just so that it will force it to go ahead and get a new one. So get certificates, um, we'll go ahead and take this one and we'll delete it. Okay, so it's done that. And now it's issuing certificate of the secret does not exist. Okay, so the certificate has been successfully issued, which is great. So now I wonder if it actually works. If I go to my Tesla.tk, it should take me into the guacamole screen and it works. So that's great. So now basically what this means is I've gone ahead and taken my Tesla.com. So you see that a little lock up there. So if you go to my Tesla.tk, this basically takes me to my guacamole screen. All right, so now to do this, the default is guac admin, which is the default username and password. And we'll do Glock admin again. Now, because we turned on two-factor authentication, it should ask me right there to go ahead and use a code. So I'm going to use Authy, um, which I use. So let's go ahead and add this two-factor authentication code. So I'm scanning the QR code with my phone right now. Um, and then it's going to go ahead and hit save. It's going to give me something to put in here. So we'll put in this code for now, 897-788. Continue. And there we go. So I have my Linux servers. I have my Windows 10 machine. I have my Linux Raspbian. Um, I'm also going to be adding my shadow PC as well. For now, I haven't. But anyways, when I click on Windows, what you'll see is it's a very nice experience. There you go. That's exactly what you saw in the Tesla. And here we go. So everything is here. It's usable. Um, and it's pretty cool. And now if I want to get out of my Windows 10 machine, it's, I just go back. And this is the cool thing is this is all in your browser, right? So, I mean, like, it's not going to get any more easier to use with your Tesla. But if I go ahead and now open my Linux, now Linux takes a little bit of time. Resolution's not the greatest. Um, but anyways, it's a working version of Linux, and you can use this on your, um, on your Tesla as well. So that's how you set up the back end. So, guys, hopefully you liked this video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing, and I will see you in the next video. Until then, stay safe and see you next time. Bye-bye.